Welcome to the second lecture um, of uh, our course uh, in uh, federal government. And let's uh, continue discussing another category of population uh, that will play an important role uh, in uh, the early colonial period and then, you know, in the history of the United States in terms of its legacy. Uh, and uh, in order for to do that, we need to talk about the, the slave trade, right, and, and the institution of slavery. Now, what um, uh, we hear, uh, because the United States, again, has a particular history in this regard, <coughs> we here need to differentiate conceptually between uh, slavery uh, and uh, uh, racism or racial discrimination, which are two different, two different things. Um, uh, slavery is a commercial uh, relationship in a way, right? Um, that has existed throughout history, and it's not related to race or ethnicity or anything in itself, right? Uh, so we have had uh, slavery in ancient Greece, uh, <coughs> where uh, Greeks would, uh, uh, you know, have slaves other Greeks, right? So Athens, when it was, a, you know, a, an empire, a city-state that was an empire, and that became an empire, you know, went around conquering, <coughs> and famously, you know, went to the island of Melos, and uh, <coughs> after conquering it, it killed, uh, you know, the, the winners, the, the conquerors, the Athenians, killed all the male and uh, enslaved all the women and children, right? So their slaves were, were Greek. You could not be able to tell them apart except for the roles that they played, right? Uh, same later on and in the Roman Empire. And, um, uh, you know, if we get to the time of the colonial period, uh, what you have, um, for example, in Africa, you have uh, slavery, right? You have slavery in the sense of, you know, some Africans uh, enslaving other African tribes, uh, conquering other tribes, and enslaving their people. So, so uh, now, it's an abominable institution in itself, right? Owning people, like, as they were objects, right? It's dehumanizing. But slavery as such is not related to race. So the question becomes, how does it become associated with race in the United States? And, and how it gets meshed up with the ra racial prejudice and racial discrimination, so that later we have issues resulting from uh, uh, racial uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, so, um, so, so let's let's start uh, start talking about the you know the slave trade. Well, even before talking about the slave trade, remember we talked about the fact that the part of the key to the success of the of the colonies was the influx of people, and especially for the southern colonies, which were more agricultural, agriculture at that time being done uh, uh, you know success in agriculture uh, being. Uh, predicated on more land and more people means more income, right? Because it was extensive agriculture, right? You needed more space and more people to call, uh, to collect the, the uh, you know, the what grew on that on that area. That was the key to your success. Today it's not the same because today we we're talking about intensive agriculture, right? We were higher productivity, uh, you know, uh, per square feet. Let me, you know to put it that way, and we have. Um, all the tools of modern agriculture, right? So you don't need, it's not the number of people, you still need people, but it's not the number of people that gives the success, the, the key to the success. So anyway, from the beginning, the colonies, you know, were interested in having more people. And it, as I said, the Southern colonies in having work hands to work these, you know, uh, lands, because the more land you have, the more people you had to work the lands, the richer you were. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, at first, you know, the or uh, from the beginning you had, people who were coming from England and work on those lands. And some of them, uh, a good number of these people came as indentured servants. Indentured servitude was an institution by which if you went into debt, into serious debt, you were either sent to jail or a better alternative was that you were uh, basically um, entered uh, uh, servanthood for a number of years, like let's say seven years, you had to work out your debt. So many of these indentured servants were sent or came uh, to to um, the colonies in North America, the British colonies, to pay off their debt to, and they were indentured servants for a number of years. Uh, not exactly like slavery, but kind of the same relationship because they, you know, it was forced labor in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and then you have the slave trade. Now, the slave trade was again. Uh, uh, in, let's focus on Africa at, that, at this point. The way it worked was that different interested parties went and bought slaves from. Uh, uh, from local rulers from Africa who sold the slaves to the to the Europeans. The Europeans didn't really go in and catch uh, slaves. I mean, that wasn't. It was. Uh, it didn't have the resources and the tools, and it was cheaper uh, and more effective for them to go to uh, the slave markets on the coast and bought the slaves from uh, African uh, 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 rulers 
In fact, um, uh, and uh, you know, this slave trade went in different directions. In fact, the biggest slave trading historically, the biggest, the, the largest number of slaves from Africa um, uh, bought it this way and taken away actually did not go to North America, not even to the Caribbean, uh, but actually went to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was the largest uh, slave, uh, slave uh, importer, so to speak. Uh, from from Africa because it was right there right it was the North Africa uh, it was much closer and they imported the, I mean in numbers incomparable to the numbers of slaves that were brought to West in uh, to the West Indies to the Caribbean which was kind of the second in number or to the northern colonies which was sort of the third in number now again none of this you know re uh, takes away the um, uh, you know the abominable nature of the institution of slavery as I said but at this point, it's a, it's a, you're buying people to you know to um, uh, to work uh, 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 you know uh, on your lands and they become property. But at the same time, this being a commercial relationship, this commercial relationship could also be dissolved. So, for example, the British will pass laws by which you know when the slaves will con would convert to Christianity, they would become free, right? Because again, it's a commercial relationship. Any commercial relationship can be made and unmade. And and so uh, uh, in the in the beginnings of the of the slave trade to North North America, you know, you would have slave, uh, formerly African uh, um, slaves who became free, and then themselves they became owners of slaves, uh, or Indians they are were, who were slaves or owners of slaves, right? So it was a commercial relationship. Now, how does this become again not not, not good? Not you know if we um, uh, uh, still still a, an, an abominable institution in itself. Right, uh, which is also why the British started to to kind of abolish it. Um, but what is the process through which this becomes associated intrinsically with, with this concept of race? Race, which is by the way a made-up concept, doesn't really exist. Yeah, there's no such thing as, as race, even by the definition. There's uh, uh, there, there is no actual content to uh, it's a made-up thing. Yeah. Uh, so how can you made up concept? Um, because you know the color of skin or anything doesn't make you know doesn't uh, you know doesn't mean that if someone is it's like uh, has a color of the skin or whatever that they have a specific culture or whatever or whatever right because you know it's like saying someone is tall then they are better at playing the violin it's like makes no sense um, and uh, and it doesn't work right so race is becomes this you know made up concept but anyway that at what point it becomes associated with 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 slavery and why well part of the process you know besides human prejudice which is always you know. Uh, present uh, and remember where we're leaving from right and so at a certain point you have you know uh, uh, free blacks you had uh, 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 blacks who were formerly from Africa right who were uh, uh, enslaved so you know it was a mix so when does this change radically so part of the process was the fact that in Britain there was a strong push towards abolishing slavery in fact Britain will be the, the power that will abolish slavery not just in terms of taking part in the slave trade but they will also uh, pass legislation by which they will mandate their own navy to stop the slave trade in Africa right the slave trade that was done between you know different powers coming to buy slaves from local you know tribes and, and, and rulers in Africa uh, to stop that and they, they it was the British Empire that, that put an end to the slave I mean that to a large degree ended the slave trade in in, uh, in Africa Bec and uh, this this push came you know was a <coughs> strong push that came from the cultural ethos uh, from the Christian ethos of the of the British culture at that, at that time uh, where you know the whole concept of slavery uh, it was was perceived as ab abominable also this is you remember I mentioned that <coughs> you know one of the earlier pieces of legislation was, if a um, slave converts to Christianity, they should be freed, right? Because again, the idea of being equal, you know, being created equal, uh, 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 you know, uh, being all children of God doesn't really work with the idea of slavery when a, a human being becomes an object and not a child of God, right? According to, you know, the Christian out outlook. Uh, so, so now, okay, so that's happening in Britain. There's this push and there's this, you know, act uh, uh, that, that push towards abolishing slavery you know, slowly and gradually they will get there. Uh, but um, that doesn't happen also in the colonies because, because the colonies were not interested in abolishing the institution of slavery for because of economic reasons. So one of the, the earlier pieces of legislation that, that kind of shows you how this move towards associating two concepts that are not related 
one of them is, which is made up, the, the concept of race, was, for example, in the 1660s when Maryland passes a law by which not only uh, the, the current uh, people of African descent who are slaves are slaves, but also their descendants, that also their children. So basically, slavery becomes genetic. So it becomes uh, 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 an inherited, inherited by birth, which makes complete no, completely no sense, of course, right? Because again, one is the commercial relationship. You don't inherit a commercial relationship, right? Uh, <coughs> it's it's absurd. Based on what? Uh, so so, but this was a way of <coughs> sort of creating a category that is stuck. Uh, in in this in this in this um, uh, in this status in this status. Although, as I said, at this point, you know, there were you know free blacks, and depending on where where they were, like you go to the southern coast of Mississippi to the Gulf Coast, and you see even historically that the, the blacks who were there, m most of them were free blacks because you know in fishing you don't really need, that's not a slavery intensive institution, right? But you go a little bit north in Mississippi and you see the history of slavery in terms of uh, uh, most African Americans being, well, those brought from Africa being uh, uh, slaves because on those lands you needed slavery. So, you know, it varied from, from place to place according to economic needs. But as I said, um, Maryland and then New York and New Jersey, Carolina, Virginia would then pass these laws associating, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, slavery with, you know, connecting slavery genetically. So making it so that not just the current slaves but also their descendants remain slaves. And this will have any significant role in reinforcing, uh, you know, uh, prejudices in creating, a, 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 again, reinforcing this made up category of race in which, you know, someone of, again, different race is, uh, you know, of a different status and so on and will create all the problems in, in US uh, history that we talked about. Um, but at the same time, you also have in, in, the, in the colonies the same push that you had in England, right, also from the same resources, you know, from the Christian impetus, and even later, when you have the abolition of slavery and the civil war and everything, it will come from the same, you know, Christian, um, um, a lot of Christian uh, uh, Puritan, Christian movements were, pu were pushing towards, uh, towards that. Um, and uh, so even as early as 1712, Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Assembly will ban the import of slaves into the colony. So as early as 1712 and so on. Uh, so yeah, so this this is this is the background for uh, for this um, uh, this other important category of population in the colonies, um, uh, and and it's important to kind of have the background for the Native Americans and for the uh, uh, categories of uh, population who will become slaves because uh, you need to understand their specific relationship with uh, of these categories with the with the colonies with the British colonies, but which is not the same as their relationship with Britain itself, right? Even if that was, sort of, so to speak, mediated through the colonies, but their status, let's say, in Britain, or how Britain saw them was not the same as how the British colonies in North America saw them. This is important as we get uh, further. Okay, uh, so moving on, um, talking about the, um, uh, you know, the colonial uh, life, and, and the question we'll have to ask, um, okay, we have 13 colonies, and, and you should know they're, they're be able to, uh, you know, um, list these 13 uh, initial colonies, uh, for example, on the test. Um, and uh, how do we move from these 13 British colonies to, to uh, uh, you know, what later we will call the United States? And in order to, you know, to understand the, the, ra the radical nature of this transformation or of, this, of the processes that, that will happen in a, over a very short period of time, uh, we need to uh, uh, remind ourselves that uh, the, the, you know, what, how did these colonials, how did these British, the population of these British colonies, how do they see themselves, right? Um, so let's, so the, if we, if we were to think of their, of their identity, right? So what were they? Well, first of all, they were British, yeah? So, and, and I'm saying they were British because Britishness at this point uh, uh, meant meant quite a lot, meant quite a lot. Um, uh, because being British uh, meant that, at that point, that you were um, part of a population that had political and civil rights that were incomparable to the population of most other countries, for example, in Europe, right? So being British was sort of a, a, an attractive, a cool, a trendy thing, uh, 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 you know, 
was regarded as, as something very advanced, yeah? Because, for example, the British had a parliament, had a parliament that by this time is more powerful than the monarch, and a parliament that was supposed to represent the, the British, uh, the prosperation of Britain. Well, not, remember that representation is not the same as voting. I'm not saying that they, everybody had the right to vote, everybody voted, or any such thing, but the parliament had, was made of representatives of the British population, and it was the parliament that had most power of ruling over them. So at this point, being, being a British person was, meant that you had certain rights, certain political, a political status that was quite elevated. You were ruled by a parliament more than you were ruled by the monarch, because the parliament was more powerful. It, you had your representatives in the parliament, right? Even if you didn't have the right to vote, but you had your representatives in the parliament and so on. Now, this, so, so, uh, and this, this understanding of themselves, this understanding um, of, of uh, uh, this political self-understanding um, and cultural self-understanding was also shared by the British colonies, right? The population of the British colonies. And this is important because when we will get to the frictions between them and uh, the government in Britain, a lot of these frictions will come from the fact that they will claim to be mistreated as British uh, citizens, as British subjects, right? Now, they were British, so they were British, but however, although they were British, by this time we have about you know a century, a century and a half uh, of of, of of presence in North America, right? So you have generation after generation being um, born here. So so besides this British dimension of the identity, there was also a distinctiveness or a distinctive, different, yeah, distinct um, uh, aspect of their identity, right? Uh, because they have developed certain things that were specifically that was uh, that were specifically theirs right there was a sense of uh, a freedom that came from the fact that they were so far from the center of power in britain and um uh, uh from the center of power in britain and uh so that allowed them to kind of do whatever they wanted at a, at a certain point so um so there was the sense of freedom as i said for example, in the 17th century, which was the most troublesome century in uh, British history, at a certain point there was no monarch, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, uh, the control over the colonies became weak. So they kind of could do whatever they wanted. They, for example, they traded uh, kind of with whoever they wanted over the, uh, internationally, although they weren't supposed to. Because simply it was easier to just let them do whatever they wanted and, you know, harder to enforce uh, uh, by the British government to enforce uh, certain controls on trade and so on. So they got used to kind of, you know, doing what they wanted. They also said, uh, had the, their own government, as I mentioned, right? They had their, their self-government. Um, so um, let's, uh, you know, as I, uh, as I mentioned, the, um, each, um, each colony was, had its own institutions of government. For, for, uh, what are institutions of government? Any institution of government needs to have three three functions. Yeah, needs to be able to pass rules, to enforce the rules, and to adjudicate rules. Meaning, to pass rules, make laws. We call them usually laws. They can be called anything else, other words as well. You need to be uh, the government needs to be able to pass laws, then to enforce these laws, and then to also uh, adjudicate, right, arbitrate when there are conflicts about the application of the laws and uh, and and these. Three functions are usually, you know, the legislative function, the executive function, and the, judi the judicial function. Now, these functions can be played by any sort of combination of institutions. It can, they can all rest in one, one person, right? You have an absolute ruler who makes rules, enforces the rules, and is also the judge supreme, right? So, now, in, in the colonies, based on the British model, because in Britain, what did you have? You have a parliament, which was most powerful. You have a monarch which was the head of the executive, uh, although you also had the prime minister, let's not go into the de details there. Uh, <clears throat> and the parliament passed the laws on the British people in, in, in Britain and the executive enforced the laws, yeah. Uh, so the same in the colonies, similar. In the colonies they had an assembly that was representative, yeah, they, who represented the population, yeah, and who passed laws over this population. So the member, so the, the 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 members of a colony were represented in the assembly, yeah, 
Uh, of course, not all of them had the right to vote and so on. And this assembly of representatives passed laws in that colony, right? And then there was a governor who was the head of the executive branch, which is in charge with implementing laws. And if the assembly was elected by the, well, not wasn't elected, it was represent, represented the, the members of the colony, right, the assembly, it was made of representatives of the population of the colony, the governor was appointed from Britain by the monarch, right? So that's what made them colonies, right? Because the head of the executive got its authority from the head of the executive in Britain, while the legislature was local. So there's, there's, uh, this is a, this is how, and then the governor had a um, council that he, right? It was male, uh, usually. A council that the governor appointed. Yeah to help uh, him govern, yeah? Govern meaning to implement the laws and to take care of the daily business, yeah? Which is what the executive branch does, executives do. do. Um, executive institutions. So notice how each colony then, it has its own institutions of government, as I said, right? But at the same time are connected institutionally with the home country, with, with Britain, yeah? which is normal because the colonies are nothing else but the projection of the state, of the British state across uh, the ocean, right? To a different continent, right? And, uh, but what, what, what was granted to them based on the British rights was the right to self-governance to a degree, to pass legislation that only concerned, you know, the business of the colonies, hence having their own assembly, right? Normally, you know, even having that is a lot, right? Um, <clears throat> so they had these institutions of self-government that, 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 you know, allowed them to self-govern. And this, is, this assembly also was the institution that not only passed laws, but also was, had the, had the uh, right to collect, uh, and, and, you know, needed and did collect taxes from the population of the colony. Um, and by the way, them having these institutions of self-governance, uh, also were, uh, was one of the reasons why the colonies were so successful um, in, uh, in, uh, compared to their, uh, how the British colonies were so successful compared to their rivals, to the French and to the Spanish. Uh, because, um, because they had a set of institutions, right? So the, remember we looked at, at, uh, at this map um, uh, last time uh, of, the North America around 1750, right? So here's how it looks, right? Right. So these are claims, right? Spanish claims, French claims, and British claims to the territory. Now, all of, of all these patches of color, of course, only this part is actually solidly populated, as we discussed, and um, populated with societies, full real societies, right? <coughs> Um, while this is most, you know, it's just claimed on paper, the only place where this actually, the, the French actually were, were, you know, a society, at what is today, you know, state of Louisiana, and what is today in Canada, Quebec, and in the middle they had the roots of, of um, um, uh, merchants uh, and of uh, transit and of transportation along the Mississippi from Quebec to, to, to you know, today's uh, southern Louisiana, right? Um, so this middle part, which was um, was not populated by the French, right? It, they had forts. You see the names of the forts here to protect these routes of commerce. Yeah. So um, so what do you have? So you don't have institutions here, right? You don't have institutions that will ensure permanence to the to to those societies, and you only have institutions and full societies here. Same with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the Spanish in North America. Mostly what they had, notice, is missions, sun, 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 yeah, and forts, yeah? Again, we talked about this. And um, uh, again, that's, you see, those, are, those are not institutions that maintain a society, right? Those are, you know, very, they are temporary and very specifically aimed at, you know, either, you know, uh, you know, fighting wars or, uh, you know, converting uh, people to Christianity, serving locally, but they are not the skeleton that maintains um, a political entity. This is why these were the, 
you know, in a, except for, with some exceptions, you know, like Southern Louisiana, as I said, and Quebec, and um, only these here were full real colonies, yeah? Because they had a society and they had political institutions that controlled and that defined each colony, right? That gave that colony its en en entity, yeah? Because each colony existed, just like states, <clears throat> the colony exists because there's a set of institutions that govern that colony, right? Now, of course, these institutions were not sovereign, right? Because they didn't have sole power over the, of, of rule over the colony, right? Because this power was delegated from England and uh, their institutions were actually dependent on the institutions in the government in England and, you know, the governor was appointed from the monarch. Uh, and, and on and on. So the, 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 they, the power they had was delegated, so to speak, from, from Britain. They had limited power of control. Overall, overarching power belonged to the government in Britain. Yeah. So they're not sovereign. However, each colony had their own institution of government. So that's what makes, you know, that's what, that's what allows for these colonies to not just exist at a certain moment, but to persist in, in time. Yeah. Uh, so that each of them has its government with uh, as I said, with control over a territory, so much so that when you go north or south from each colony, you will encounter the sphere of action of another set of institutions. Yeah, this is why we have 13 colonies, because we have 13 sets of governing institutions. Okay, what else made them distinct? They made them distinct was this, uh, 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 um, to a degree, was um, a, a specific role that the economic concerns played in the very ethos of the colonies because from the beginning right economic success has been embedded into the very ethos of 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 being a colonist and and it, it became uh, uh, a primordial and and primary concern overarching concern um you know so much so that later on when you know we're going to read the articles of confederation we're going to read the u.s constitution and you'll see that the concern with economic success is embedded in these fundamental uh, pieces of legislation, in, in these fundamental documents of the states that will form, uh, which is not true for uh, every country around the, or any country around the world. And even today, we all recognize that this, this uh, concern with economic success, with making money, with being rich, this, uh, and also in, in, um, in many ways, the admiration we have for people who are economically successful and how they stand in the public I, you know, the prominence of rich people, we pay attention to them. This is very American. And, uh, you know, for example, if you go to, you know, and live in France, uh, just as an example, and again, from using our comparative perspective and always, you know, when always we compare things with, it's not to say that one is better, one is worse. That's up to you to make your uh, judgment. Uh, but we need to understand that things can be different, right? And that's kind of our, our engagement, uh, our, our mission in this course, to, to, to look at this, political system that we inhabit, as it were, from the outside, to being held by seeing how things are done uh, elsewhere or how they were done at a different time it was, uh, still in, a, in America. So if you go to France and live in France, you will, you, and you, you turn on the TV and you, you, know, you have guests coming in to give their opinion or to comment on things or to you know, give their pieces of wisdom, uh, you will see that uh, uh, the people who are highly regarded and sort of listened to very often are uh, writers, are um, um, poets, philosophers, right? You would never get a poet being invited to the, you know, on American TV to kind of give his opinion about the, the state of affairs in the United States. That's, that we never had that in America, in the United States, this never has been, this has never been the function of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, we never regarded them, in, they never held them in this high regard in this sense, uh, because it's simply, you know, these are cultural differences. Or, you know, the first president of uh, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic, after they got rid of uh, communism in, after 1989, was a playwright, Václav Havel, right? Uh, a writer of plays, yeah, and, the, he, and he used to write plays against the communist regime, and then he became the first president, but because he was valued for his wisdom, and that guy was associated with his status as a, as a writer, it was associated with the idea that, you know, writers are wiser, you know? Uh, now, we don't have that, right? We're going to listen to and we're going to want to see what does Elon Musk say? So what does Jeff Bezos say? What does uh, whatever, you know, um, 
what about the rich guys? <laughs> Would that be Bill Gates or whoever else? Um, uh, what do they say, right? We kind of value differently. So this concern with, with economy and economic success, this value that we put on that, which also goes back to, you know, what uh, Max Weber, um, famous author, you know, talked about, uh, uh, you know, he, he talk, connected capitalism with the pro Protestant spirit, right? He said that these are connected and uh, Protestantism has helped valuing economic success and so on. Um, you can read up on, on that if you want. So anyway, there is also, this is, makes, this is a distinctive, um, becomes a distinctive trait of the, of the, of the perhaps more so than back home. Of, of these uh, British colonies. Uh, another thing that uh, is distinctive for that is this ex uh, the expansiveness, the, the expansive ethos of the colonies, because it was in their DNA from the beginning that that they needed to that they needed to expand. Yeah, uh, from the beginning, expansion was in their DNA because expansion was the key to uh, the key to success. Right, so. Uh, uh, expansion both in the sense of moving westward, right, because more land meant growth, meant more success, and also in terms of bringing more people in, uh, because bringing more people in was a key to the success of the colony, because the, the higher, bigger the population, the richer you can get, get yeah? So, um, so ex this expansiveness is also part of the DNA of the colonies. Um, so all of these, what I'm trying to say, and I'm just pointing out just some, some, um, some things, so these were British, yeah, the population of the colonies. They were British because, you know, they belonged to the British uh, Empire and so on um, and were proud of being British. And, you know, culturally and, uh, you know, uh, politically, this, this gave, gave them sets of rights that were, you know, outstanding. Uh, but also they developed traits, yeah, and other, you know, customs and habits that had to do with the fact that, well, they're far away still from Britain. They had a history of self-governance and had a degree of freedom that was higher probably than, than back home because simply the control was harder to, to impose from then on. You had this whole space where you were, had the impetus of expanding and so on and so on. Now, why, the real, why do I say this? Because you need to, we need again to ask how do we move from this being British and a little bit something else, but you know, British essentially. Because remember, you know, Britain will become a worldwide empire, so you will have British people throughout the world, and still they remain British, right? Uh, for example, later on in India, you will have uh, the British Raj, and you will have British people who um, live there and get married there, or even are born there, and yet they, they remain British, and they will not form a colony there, uh, and so on. So how does all of this move from being British to then refusing the connection or cutting the connection with, with Britain, yeah, to which you belong. So in order to see this transformation and to follow this transformation, uh, we will um, list a few, some of the factors that will lead this. And actually the first moment, which is also a factor in this process of moving from colonies to independent states, um, uh, the, one of the first moments uh, uh, and also factor in this process will be the French and Indian War. <coughs> the French So the French and Indian War, uh, which, which was what, right? So let's think logically. Why is it called the French and Indian War? What could it, what could it denote? What could it mean? Um, well, it was a conflict between the colonies and on the one side and the French and the Indians on the other side, i.e. the French and the Native American populations on the other side. Now, why were these the two sides? Why were the French and the Native Americans on the same side? Well, quite obviously, right, if you look at the map and we're talking about expansion, is we're going to see that as soon as we expand a little bit, right, what do we see, right? We got, we bump into two different populations who at this point will, will, will be united by the same cause. We, as, as the colonies expand, they will bump into the territories that the French claimed <coughs> where they had forts, which were their trade routes, right? And also, the more you expand, you, the more you get to, to ancestral lands of the Native American tribes, you know, it's one thing to encounter them randomly or smaller groups or, you know, roaming and you encounter them. Another thing is to get to sort of you keep pushing them and you get to their ancestral lands. So when you 
try to push them out, it, it inevitably results in conflict. So this is why it was the French and Indian War uh, uh, happened. It, it was uh, it was part of, of it was part of the clash between this impetus, this expansive impetus and ethos of the colonies, and uh, you know the interests that opposed them, which were you know of the Native Americans who lived there. And remember, the French who did not push the Native Americans out of this territory, yeah, but. Um, but who traded with, this, with the Native Americans from this territory. Because remember, the French only really established societies here and here. So the fact that they only had forts and traded with them, uh, the, the Native Americans were not necessarily threatened by the French, contrary to the expansion of these colonies. Right? So had, this is how you have this conflict. Now, the French or France has a standing army, has a, uh, has a you know, trade army. Colonies don't have such a thing, right? So what do they do? They need to you know, who's going to fight the war for them, you know, regular people, militias and so on, each of them with their own guns that's not going to resist, you know, not going to be able to face the French ordered army and trained army. <coughs> so it's the British troops, yeah, they're, they're troops, the troops of Britain, of, you know, of the mother country, uh, who is supposed to, <laughs> who has protected their trade across the oceans, is also supposed to protect and uh, their interest in uh, North America. This also, on the other hand, is also connected with a broader uh, global sort of conflict between Britain and France uh, at this point, vying for influence both in Europe and across the, across the globe. Uh, so, so what you will have here will be British, Britain will send troops to fight the interest for the interest of the colonies. Some of the colonies will, you know, will join as militiamen, some of the colonies will become members of the, uh, in the British army, like George Washington famously. Yeah, uh, who was an officer in the British Army, uh, and because uh, that was their army, right? Uh, and uh, eventually, the British uh, will win. The British will win this conflict, and it will end with the peace of uh, Treaty of uh, Paris in 1763. Now, it's important to pay attention to this because look at uh, let's pay attention to this date here, 1763. Well, and to uh, and and realize, I invite you to realize that this is. 10 short years before the Declaration of Independence. So what's going to happen in 10 short years, basically 10, 12 years, yeah, that will move from we're fighting a war against the French and the Indians because this is the interest of the colonies, to the colonies suddenly rejecting the very uh, you know, country that, uh, to which they belonged and which has fought a war for them. Yeah, so we, this is the process, and as I said, it was it happens over a short period of time and with uh, and with great intensity. Uh, and uh, so we're going to have to examine um, uh, uh, why this happened. What are some of the factors that that lead to this happening? Um, <clears throat> so, so and the main one of the first factors will be this war, and why? Because um, what do we know about wars? Yeah, well, we know about wars that uh, they cost money. Yeah, and how do how do governments obtain that money? The governments obtain that money by extracting them from their population uh, through through taxes. Yeah, um, and uh, but at this point, the, the the colonies remember were not taxed directly by Britain. Yeah, so most of the money that went into fighting these wars were, were uh, extracted and paid by. The population of Britain. Yeah. Uh, now there's a problem with extracting, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> this kind, this amount of resources because there's a limit to how much you can keep extracting before you turn the population against you. And again, I, 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 I you know, we go back to 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 again this this important date uh, because uh, 1763. Because if you know anything of world history. This is a short, what, 30 something years, 30 odd years, uh, or even less, before one of the most momentous events in French history and world history, which is, will be the French Revolution. The French Revolution, which will change the face of France forever. And many people say famously that France has still not recovered from the French Revolution, which will erase an entire uh, sort of way of being, uh, physically as well, a lot of bloodshed. 
So a brutal, gigantic event that will erase an entire, you know, civilization in a way of, in the sense of how they how they lived and would transform it into something else, and which will be caused by the fact that the French government was involved in so many wars that it kept putting taxes on its population that they alienated their population, which revolted against them. Yeah. So. When we're talking about fighting these wars, we're talking about an expense of resources that, that is uh, incredible. I mean, even today, fighting wars across, the, across uh, overseas, we all know, costs l inc incredible amounts of money. Yeah? And we, it's not, they're not, uh, sums that are not really bearable at, after a certain point, even today. Now, this is, what, two, three hundred years ago. Yeah? So, you can ima imagine that you know, they face the same challenges. And unlike the French, the British government was smart enough to say, you know, let's let's put a, let's 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 manage this because if we keep putting, if we keep recklessly taxing our population, we're going it's going all going to crumble. The French didn't do this, and it crumbled. Yeah. So I'm just pointing out the importance of these of this of these pressures and of these issues, and also to point out that the measures that we will talk um, uh, in in a second about. Uh, you will see that well. You, you will start understanding why they were passed, because uh, if we were to list the number, you know, uh, what were the factors? What were the factors that sort of led to this uh, break, uh, uh, to this gigantic radical transformation in a short ten years, <coughs> to move from you know colonies to independent statehood, and, and you know, uh, as we discussed. We we'll, we'll, we need to list what to, what to identify these factors, and I will group them in several categories. First, there will be measures and responses. Measures meaning legal uh, measures, legal decisions, laws passed, decision taken then by the British government. So British measures, you know, and responses from the colonies, and each uh, and the way these interacted and the way they were passed and the way these happened led to an escalation of that of that uh, uh, break or that led eventually to a breakup right so there's a series of measures some of them you know even if justified perhaps not passed in the wisest of ways and rather responses from the colonies that were perhaps exaggerated perhaps unjustified or perhaps justified but it's this escalation that will contribute to happening to that happening what will, what, what will happen yeah so one of the first measures, but it all starts with you know the French Indian War. One of the first measures was the Proclamation of 1763. And the Proclamation of 1763 was a, was a measure passed by the British government, by which, uh, and this map shows it. Yeah, this is the Proclamation line of 1763, by which the British government forbade the colonies from further expanding beyond the Appalachian Mountains. So they drew a line to more or less their current. A reach, yeah, and it corresponded with the Appalachian Mountains. That's so it's so good we can use this geographical form to kind of stop them from expanding. Why? Because it wanted to stop having to deal with conflicts with the Native Americans. But again, because again of these continuous expenses that this entailed, that this would this would have entailed. Now, how did the colonies react to this? I would argue, or someone would argue, justified means a measure by the British government. Obviously, they were. In, intensely <laughs> unhappy, yeah, because of what we just talked about, that the expansiveness, you know, later we'll talk about, you know, um, manifest destiny and all these things that, you know, it's, you know, we have the right to expand and this is key to our economic success. Remember what we just discussed, right? This was in their cultural DNA, yeah, in their ethos, into what they, how they saw themselves, what they saw as key to their success and subsistence. So that clashed with their interests. So this will be one of the first measures that will that will are ang anger the, the, the colonists. Then all in 1764, you will have the Sugar Act, which was a tariff. Now, what is a tariff? A tariff is a, 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 a fee, right? Uh, on uh, trade, yeah, or either import or export, yeah. That's a tariff. So it's not a tax. It's not a direct tax. It's it's basically if you're importing, you know, I don't know, cars from Japan, then you have to pay a fee, a, a tariff. Let's say even today, let's say, yeah. Uh, so this this was a tariff on certain goods, uh, on uh, as the name says of to the Sugar Act. On uh, sugar was one thing, 
but other foods um, as well, such as textiles, coffee, wines, and indigo dye, right? Uh, all of which were imported from within the British Empire. So, <clears throat> so there was a tariff on this because why? Because the Britain needed funds, right? So they put tariff on, 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 on imports, which again is not outrageous. Every government puts such tariffs yeah, on trade. That's the normal thing that the governments do <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, but the, obviously the, um, uh, the colonies were unhappy, especially those in the northern, northeastern colonies, right, who, whose money was made through trade. Yeah? And remember, I mentioned the fact that they could trade up to recently. A lot of their trade was done irregularly, right, sort of bypassing the regulations of the British Empire because it just didn't have the will or the, or the wherewithal or whatever to enforce uh, its rules. So basically the colonies could trade freely. Yeah? So, okay, well now they're enforcing the trade rules, which is any government does, but now that hurts the interests of the merchants in the northeastern colonies. Merchants who, remember, normally would be some of the strongest supporters of the British Empire because they benefit from its existence and from trade within the British Empire. Also in 1764, you have the Currency Act, by which uh, the government in Britain forbade the colonies from emitting their own paper uh, bills, their own paper tender. Now remember that at this time you don't have a one central bank like today, which emits and controls all the influx of money. You have many currencies and each colonies could produce or bank, different banks could produce their own currencies. Um, uh, and also there was the British made uh, currency. Uh, by stopping them producing their own currencies, this was a way to control the monetary policy. Remember when you produce too much currency on the market, there's inflation, whatever. But it hurt, again, what? The economic interests of the... Of, of some of the colonies because you know uh, because at a certain point currency became scarce and you cannot become rich if there's no actual money that you can own right because when the, uh, the amount of currency that you can amass is uh, limited so it, it, it impeded their you know enrichment and commerce and whatever 1765 you, there's another uh, piece of legislation the stamp act and this pay attention this stamp act will be the first direct tax on the population of the colonies. Uh, first one, first. Um, and how does it happen? Well, today, how do you pay taxes? You pay taxes to the federal government through for, from each paycheck. You know, they extract something from the paycheck. And also once a year by April 15, you need to do a tax declaration and to pay a percentage of your income, right? That's your tax, yeah? Why does the current government, why is it able to do that? because it has the institution and the system and the technology to know what your income is. So you have those paychecks, yeah? It's all computerized, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> they have a, they can track you down <coughs> unless you're paid under the table, so to speak, um, or uh, with no papers, or um, uh, they can track you down in terms of your income and IRS can come after you and so on. Now, there was no such system of institutions for the British government to be able to see how rich was every member of the colony the way this would could have been done or would be done let's say in britain would be like okay it's uh, by uh, you know how the tax on on houses or how, how big the house is or how big the, your field uh, your um, your properties are so it, it's a tax on property because that's measurable income is hard to hard to measure and you don't know how much money actually one person has because you don't have payrolls and paychecks and so on so what was the uh, way to, for the British government to be able to extract some direct payments from the population of the colonies? Through stamps. So basically every printed uh, material in the colonies had to now uh, bear a stamp and you would buy this stamp from you know, basically the British government and that's, it was the cost of the stamp that was the tax that you were paying. I mean, <laughs> if you think of it, that wasn't that much. Yeah? Um, and, and, and with all of this, with all of this, at this point, you know, the, the colonists compare, comparatively, like, this is the first direct tax on the colonies. The rest were tariffs. How many people did uh, trade with internationally, right? Only those people paid tariffs, right? So how much were actually the colonies hurt by, by these taxes and so on? Not much, in fact. In fact, the, comparatively, the population of Britain paid 26 times more in taxes than the population of the colonies taxes and tariffs 26 times more yeah 
So they were bearing the brunt of all of you know things, uh, the adventures like the French and Indian War and so on. And again, I'm giving you this information to kind of see the you know were these measures justified, but also even if they're justified, you know, and arguably they were, um, you know, legislative measures are not just passed because they make sense. They need to be passed uh, when you pass legislative measures. This is true for any government. There is also um, an evaluation of of the capacity of the of the population on which you're imposing these measures to bear that measure. Yeah. Today we have opinion polls. We have you know lobbying. We have all of this. There's always a back and forth in which before passing a law, generally they kind of feel it out. Yeah. Is this going to be accepted? There needs to be a certain degree of okay yeah because the danger is you know you can pass as many laws as you want if you break a certain barrier if you overburden the population the law will not be effective because overall what makes a law effective is not enforcement is acquiescence is the fact that the population willingly acquiesces to that law also with the threat of punishment but it's not as bad or as hurtful so that they have no other choice but to revolt as it happened in the french revolution so anyway, so the Stamp Act, uh, that was the Stamp Act. And also in 1765, you have the Quartering Act, which required the um, colonies to host and to feed British troops. Well, you know, they came to fight your wars. Uh, how about you also can contribute to their sustenance, uh, uh, to, right, to, <laughs> to keeping them up? I mean, you can't just, oh, come when we need you and then, you know, leave or, or whatever, right? Immediately thereafter. <clears throat> so again, you see that these measures, we kind of see why they were passed, right? However, as I said, it's not just passing measures, <clears throat> but it's how you pass the measures and also how they're re received and how they're interpreted. Because, for example, famously, the Stamp Act was, it was the act that uh, resulted in the famous call, no taxation without representation. And where did this come from? This came from the fact that these colonists, remember, they called, they were British, yeah? They were British, and part of British, Britishness was the principle of, as I said, of representation. And as we discussed uh, uh, earlier, uh, the population of the colonies was represented each the population of each colony in their own assembly they however did not have representation in the parliament in britain however it was the parliament in britain that passed the piece of legislation that um, uh, imposed taxes on them like the stamp act yeah so we're not represented here so you shouldn't have the right to pass uh, to extract taxes from us because we're not represented there that was a british idea in most countries, this wouldn't be even an argument because in most countries, the, 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 the citizens, the people, had no such rights. They needed, it wasn't like, oh, I need to be represented there in order for them to be able to tax me, right? So notice how important Britishness is, right, to even make the argument later for secession because they build the whole argument on right, the rights of a British person, yeah? Um, so no taxation without representation was only our assembly where we are represented should have the right to tax us directly. So that's the, that's the, you know, the messaging. So there's measures and responses. Other factors that will contribute will be certain events. Events that we have, you have heard of that are famous, and I'm going to mention uh, in 1770, the famous Boston massacre yeah the boston massacre again pay attention to the name right uh key events um um who uh, were, were again what is important is not necessarily exactly what happens but how that event is interpreted um so for example um the boston massacre what was it uh, was a group of colonists a small group, some of which had a little bit much to drink, started throwing rocks, snowballs, snowballs with rocks, at armed British soldiers. Yeah. Okay, picture the scene, picture the scene. This is in Boston. Yeah. Now, put it on in today's context. Yeah. What would happen if you would start throwing rocks at armed cops? 
Yeah? Or what would, would happen, you go to the, the next army base, and you go to the armed guards and start throwing rocks on them. What will happen? Yeah? Nothing good <laughs> will come of this. So what, com uh, what, what comes out of this is that the, the, the soldiers will respond, they will, start, you know, they, will even, they will start shooting, five people will die, eight will be injured, yeah? massacre, remember. Yeah? Uh, and the British, actually the British soldiers will be put on trial because you know, they shot and killed certain, you know, a number of people. And who will defend them? But you know, future famous political leader of the United States and independence leader, John Adams was a lawyer there and who defended them successfully because they were provoked and they are exonerated because well again what happens if you start attack some soldiers in the next army base with rocks or what happens if you th attack p p police officers with rocks okay so but okay this is the event but how does it remain known as the Boston massacre now why is this important although already I'm sure you understand. Because it's, it's not just, you know, what happens, as I said. It's how it is interpreted. Because slowly but surely, you'll have a, a, a group of, of opinion leaders, of elites, who, who will start pushing towards this idea of, of, of separation. Uh, but it's very hard to make this point when the case is that your identity is British, yeah? And you also have some other dimensions, but it's all one. It's a, it's a mix, it's intertwined. I'm British, but also have some particularities. So how do you move from that to, oh, no, no, we're something else, we need to separate, we need to part. And as I said, these measures and counter responses, these events, and especially how they are uh, um, interpreted, were especially how they interpret it, will contribute to what's very important in, in the formation of a, of a picture of an us versus them. Uh, because, you know, at this point we were all us. Now how do we create an us that is different from them? What is it that unites, what is it that unites a, um, um, a group of people more than anything else? Well, obviously a common enemy. So creating the image of a common enemy will be key, right, will be key in defining an us versus them, in separating, our, uh, 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 creating a distinct identity, a distinct claim for a, a claim for, and, and claiming a different identity or a different path, right? right? From what we just are or were as British who just fought the war against the French and Indian, Indians, you know, with, you know, who are held by the British army. So the Boston Massacre is one of these key events because it's still known, right? It, the echoes still reverberate, <coughs> you know, through, all through grade school and civics classes, right? People are taught this, yeah? Because massacre means very clearly that there's one side that does the massacring and the other side that is massacred, that there's an us and there's a them, and they are the aggressors. You see how important these things are. The other event, uh, another event that was also key in this, in this, uh, and you all know about it in 1770, what was 1773, I think. Um, just trying to be, yeah, 1773, trying to be precise, was the Boston Tea Party. Uh, the Boston <coughs> uh, Tea Party, right, uh, also remains well known. Now, what was it about, again? Because what it remains known as is one thing. So, a group of colonists who wanted to, prov uh, who were on the side of, you know, separating from Britain, um, dressed as Native Americans, uh, jumped on British commercial ships and dumped the tea that they have brought in overboard into the water, creating damages probably in today's currency millions of dollars. Yeah? So it was an act of sabotage, even terrorism we could call it, yeah? in, in the sense of, you know, you know destroy the, something impressive. Terrorism is when you do an act that creates, um, uh, that, that, uh, creates a lot of damage and scares the population in order to achieve political uh, ends, political uh, results, uh, political change. And that's kind of what it was. 
Now, why did this happen? Yeah. Well, usually you would say, and you, what you pre people know generally from what they heard and in grade school, as I said, is that because of taxes on tea. Well, that's actually false or partially true. Because what was true is that uh, uh, the taxes on imported tea that was brought by Brit British merchant ships, uh, that tea was not taxed. So the market was flooded by cheap tea brought by British commercial ships. The tea imported by local merchants from the northeastern colonies was taxed, so it was more expensive. So this was a, a measure which hurt the interest of those who traded in tea. Well, how many were they? Clearly not the majority of the population. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, if a bunch of rich people who trade are going to complain that, oh, it's harder for me to trade, most of the people would say, who cares? Yeah. If, if uh, as I said, G Jeff Bezos complains that he's lost a billion dollars from his 60 billion or 600 billion, or how much he has, nobody will care. Yeah. But, but <clears throat> so, so what was the argument? Well, actually, the cheap tea that they brought in and the fact that so much cheap tea was coming in, the, the rhetoric was that they're trying to buy our um, uh, sub subjectness, to buy our uh, 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 subordination. They're bribing us into, into being their subjects. Well, you know, I mean, I don't see many people going to Walmart and protesting the low prices, yeah? Right, <laughs> because normally the population is happy to pay us as little as possible. Yeah, but it's again how you put it, and because they couldn't say, well, people don't buy cheap tea from from India. Yeah, I'm gonna buy it. He's gonna say, don't buy it because they're trying to buy our subjection through that cheap tea. Kind of a weird argument. So that's what what this was. Uh, uh, this what this was about. Because again, the taxes on tea is like how many people were were hurt by this. However, speaking of hurt, a lot of these measures, uh, uh, as I said, tax this, tax and that, and the other, was um, um, hurt parts of the population of the colonies that some of these uh, uh, portions of the population used to be the biggest supporters of the British, of you know, of, of belonging to, to Britain, because, you know, they were British. I'm talking about the merchants, I'm talking about the southern planters. And so this was a, uh, this is when I said that some of these measures, either even if they were justified, were, were not passed wisely. Yeah. For example, you could have reserved some seats in the parliament in Britain to some of the members of the colonies. Now, it wasn't done at that time, so it would have been like a genius, whoever would have come up with that measure. Because uh, today it's done. Like today in the parliament uh, of Italy, for example, there are seats reserved for people of Italian descent from South America and from North America, US and Canada. Yeah. Uh, so people who live overseas, were born overseas of Italian descent, have representation in the parliament in Italy. So it's done today. It was, but it's a very recent thing, literally like in the last 20, 25 years, that this has become a practice around the world. Now, but, I, so, but I'm just saying that things could have, done, could have been done differently. Now, also with the Boston Tea Party, the goal of them doing this act of sabotage, of terrorism, and creating such gigantic damages and hurting the, the, the commercial interests of the British merchants was to force, the, well, the goal of these people who did the, British, the Boston Tea Party was to force the British government to take some radical measures. And they did in response to the Boston Tea Party, to this act of sabotage, maybe terrorism, they abolished, uh, shut down the uh, legislature, the assembly of Massachusetts, inst instated direct government uh, by the governor appointed by the monarch. So further escalated the situation, which is what they wanted, these Boston Tea Parties. Okay, so we have certain events and interpretation of events. We have propaganda. And by which I don't mean something negative or positive. I just mean, you know, this uh, concerted effort to, pro pro uh, you know, to propagate yeah, certain ideas or a certain point of view. Uh, so clearly directed at convincing people about cert a certain thing, yeah, propaganda. <coughs> it's about propagating yeah, an idea. Uh, and uh, the way it was done, this was mo <coughs> mostly through pamphlets that were distributed and that made the argument for for separation uh, like famously uh, Thomas Paine's 
Thomas Paine's um, pamphlet essay, uh, Common Sense, which contains the famous phrase, it is time to part. Not to party, but to part. <clears throat> yeah? Um, which, which, you know, pieces of rhetoric that were very powerful, yeah, to convince the people of the necessity for, for uh, you know, separating from, from Britain. Because again, it was hard. And, you know, just like today, this is a huge territory from, nor from you know, Massachusetts to, to Maine, Massachusetts to, to Georgia, right? Even today is a gigantic territory. So how do you create a current of opinion behind the common idea? <clears throat> So propaganda, you know, spreading, you know, making case, making the case, you know, powerfully. It is time to part. Uh, um, and there will be um, uh, other, you know, such key buzzwords, you know, just like taxation without representation, right? It's very important to make uh, uh, to create these buzzwords, this propaganda to, towards to support uh, this idea to convince people, yeah, that it's a that it's an us versus them, and it's 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 it's. We only we can only go one way. There's only one out, one way out. Yeah. Then the other thing, uh, propaganda, as I said, is another factor, another tool. Uh, and again, I don't mean in the wrong way. Just you know, creating a current of opinion in a certain way. Uh, <clears throat> organization, organizing. I.e., what creating institutions. Yeah that would support the uh, whole impetus uh, towards uh, 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 separation. <clears throat> and, you know, famously, you have all these organizations that will form in every colony or most colonies, like the Sons of Liberty. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, uh, let's see you know, whatever, uh, all, all kinds of cool names <laughs> that, because it's important. Again, rhetoric is important. Uh, and, um, you know, Sons of Liberty sounds good, right? <clears throat> Even later, remember, <clears throat> um, <coughs> we talk about patriots and loyalists, well, which one sounds better? Anyway, so Sons of Liberty, which will be like cells of people of the same opinion, organized in different colonies who could agitate in each colony to create a current of opinion in support of this. Other forms of organization would be the first Continental Congress that's in 1774 and the second Continental Congress uh, which will take place in 1775-6 uh, over the winter. <coughs> Um, which would be what? Which would be gatherings of delegates from each of these colonies. Delegates. Um, but, you know, I mean, they weren't elected. Yeah, They were part of the local elites. Yeah, Maybe part of the uh, local political elites, local commercial elites, and so on. <coughs> who got, obviously, mostly leaning in one specific direction. Who met, and this is the important part that they're called the Continental Congress. First of all, Continental Congress, already the names should <laughs> raise eyebrows because what do you mean Continental? Because you're representing, if anything, these colonies and not even that, right? Uh, but they're saying, no, 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 we're the Continental Congress. You can kind of see how they see themselves in the future. Again, this impetus towards expansion, like this continent is ours just to conquer, right? Uh, to expand. Uh, <clears throat> And delegates, as I said, from these from these um, colonies, because you need to form an institution to be able to speak with a common voice. Yeah. So when they said Continental Congress, it could have been called the Thirteen Colonies Congress. Congress means assembly, gathering. Yeah. It's the gathering of representatives of the colonies. Yeah. So that's what you know. Congress means gathering of something, co uh, congregating. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so when you when they call themselves the Continental Congress, it's a very highfalutin name for basically the gathering of the representatives of 13 colonies, well, delegates from 13 colonies. And it's important because these 
institutionalizing this way, they are able to speak with one voice and to again creating the institutional basis for, for, uh, for an I, for an us. Yeah, because us now, who is us? Well, here's the gathering of the deputy, the delegates from all the co co colonies. There is an us. There is an institutionalized us. Yeah, that talks to them, them who have massacred us. Yeah. So these institutionalized uh, forms of, of speaking with one voice, even if they didn't actually represent the population, because nobody did an opinion poll of the whole population, what they wanted, yeah, uh, uh, is very powerful, because this is the next step. This is the only way to, to do something as, as in common, right? To create an institution that represents or speaks for us in common. And finally, so organizing is an important thing, creating institutions institutions of you know us yeah and then finally war and of course this is key because the moment the conflict starts the dialogue stops like the definition of war is in many ways you know is 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 in many ways that it's it's, it's what happens when di the dialogue or the conversation stops uh, so you always need to maintain conversation. Later on, when we have the civil war, it will all start with the representatives of the southern states leaving the U.S. Congress so that there's no more conversation. So conflicts that are inevitable are no, uh, no longer uh, solved through conversation, through dialogue, through argument, but are solved through violent conflict. And, and another thing that war does, first of all, it ends conversation, it create it obviously a war inevitably comes with bloodshed with victims and bloodshed inevitably leads to escalation right because someone you know there's just an encounter and a few people die oh suddenly it's a massacre we need to kill some of them oh some of them are killed then and also there's nothing like war to clearly differentiate <coughs> the us versus them to clearly differentiate the image of an enemy so starting a war was sort of the last straw that broke the camel's back because there's there's not much space to back down and this is clearly a way to define an us versus a them yeah so all of these factors will lead uh, to the second continental congress uh you know uh, uh, passing and asking thomas jefferson to write a, a document that will be called the declaration of independence and for the second continental congress to pass this to approve and pass this declaration, uh, meaning these delegates, to pass this declaration and by which they will claim the right to become from 13 colonies to become 13 states. But we will discuss in detail the Declaration of Independence in the next uh, class. We'll dedicate the entire class, uh, probably, I mean, assuredly, to, to discussing the Declaration of uh, uh, Independence. Um, so uh, thank you. And uh, I will see you in the next class.